Okay, so <clears throat> yes, Chris couldn't make it. Um, he's actually gone to uh, a conference on indigenous students that are working in science, technology, engineering, and math that's in Vancouver. And he was hoping to get to the conference here, but the snow meant that he couldn't. So I'm going to be filling in for him, which means that uh, it's me talking about his work, and I'm a little bit less familiar with it than he is. So that's why we started a little bit late, because I probably won't have as much to say as he would have said. OK, so. Uh, this is the intent or the purpose of his um, thesis project. He's doing a PhD project working on Metal Earth data. And this isn't directly transect related. It's more a, uh, a geophysical technique thesis. So uh, we're not expecting the results are going to have a material impact on any of the interpretation from the transects, but it's really just a, a way of um, doing technique development, which is one of the intentions of Metal Earth when it was first proposed. So um, the problem in this case is to image the geophysical crust in the upper 10 kilometers. So this is the upper crust. And we've found that uh, the seismic isn't necessarily that good at imaging the upper crust. What we get is basically uh, um, no reflections. So that's what they call seismically transparent. And sometimes it's difficult and expensive to get the gear into those areas anyway. So the cost of collecting seismic data is prohibitive. And it's really lucky that the Middle Earth Project did have enough budget to be able to collect a lot of seismic data. And each geophysical method is limited by the amount of information that it can infer about the subsurface. So the more geophysical methods you can combine together, the better the information that you'll get out of it. So uh, this just talks about the data that was collected in the Metal Earth project. The reflection images, uh, as I said, seismically transparent or silent in the upper five or 10 kilometers. There's broadband magnetotelluric data. And this is generally optimized for imaging the lower crust and the upper mantle. Um, but there is some information, fortunately, in the upper crust, but it tends to be isolated conductors. Fortunately, for the Metal Earth Project, they do coincide with uh, many zones that are metalliferous. And then there's gravity data, um, and that is sensitive to the upper crust, but it tends to be a little bit unreliable because the gravity data can be interpreted multiple different ways. So depending on what you want to get out of the data and what preconceptions you have, you can end up with a different interpretation because gravity data is non-unique. Um, multiple different models can explain the same data. So in order for us to get something geologically reasonable, we have to tell it something about the um, uh, the model. For example, we have to tell it what the susceptibilities are, uh, or we have to tell it uh, what the geometries are. So in this particular project, Chris was intending to uh, invert the gravity data, but constrain that gravity data with seismic refraction information. Uh, and um, the Middle Earth project did collect a lot of seismic refraction data. And there was one profile I think that was interpreted uh, by a student at um, Western University. Uh, and so Chris has been working on trying to extract some information some, from seismic refraction data. So the particular area that he's using is in the uh, Western Wabagoon terrain. Uh, and there's one transect uh, here. See this little red line that I've just gone over? You can probably barely see it. That's the uh, the uh, transect that goes over the South Sturgeon Greenstone Belt, which is the geological feature that you see marked in green, although there are other greenstone belts around. So the idea is ultimately to use the refraction data that was collected along that line and see what we can extract out of it. Um, but also, the reason why he picked this area is because there's some old legacy lithoprobe data that runs right up here over uh, 100 kilometers or so. Uh, and there's another line that runs across here. So one's a north-south line and the other one's east-west line. And that 
data can be used to work out what's going on at depth. So each of these little red dots you see, those are source locations. There was a dynamite explosion that went off. Uh, this was back in the 80s and uh, people were allowed to do that sort of thing. So that data we probably can't collect anymore. It was a large dynamite explosion because it had to be sensed uh, 200 kilometers or so away. Also, it's useful because this line here had sources and receivers on it and this line did over here. So that means rays that are going across like this are going across this South Sturgeon Greenstone Belt and across this uh, seismic line here. So that provides us with some extra information that might be able to see deeper. So that's the super regional area, which is um, that's 50, 100 kilometers, and that's about 150 kilometers. Oh, sorry, that's 200 kilometers. So it's uh, very large. You can see Thunder Bay's in here. This is uh, Lake Superior in black. And this way, now we're just zooming in, and now you can see part of the, of the north-south line and part of the east-west line through here. Um, and this is the Metal Earth transect down here in black. In this case, it's black because there's gravity stations that are every, uh, 300 meters apart. And all these other little black dots around here is a slightly more dense gravity network that uh, was available to us from the Geological Survey of Canada. But also out here there are other gravity stations. You can see they're about 15 kilometers apart. So that's our regional scale data. And then we've got detailed transect scale data with the gravity stations that are 300 meters apart along here. Uh, that's along the transect. And there's also seismic data. And what we're seeing here is a little bit of the seismic data. Uh, mostly these are the reflections that are evident from the data. And this has been interpreted. So what we're seeing here is Chong Ma's interpretation. And he's interpreted uh, this layer down here where there's lots of seismic reflections as the Nyset crust. And then there's a break here that he says is the basal thrust. Uh, and it comes up to surface through here. This is the Winnipeg River terrain. So the ultimate goal is to understand what's going on in this western Wabagoon terrain. And the problem is, is that the gravity data we collected and the seismic data we collected was along this line here. And you can see that there are some felsic uh, intrusives to the south and to the north. And these are off the profile line. So they're away from where we've collected the data. So we, we have to somehow infer what's off the line, which is a little bit of a challenge. So that's why uh, the regional and the super regional data are being incorporated into it. So just to give you a sense of what's happening, this is his strategy. His strategy is to first work on the super regional data and work out as much as possible from that data. And what I'll be talking about is the results he's done for this first part. And then there'll be two other parts working on and inverting the regional data once he's constrained aspects from the super regional. And then once he's constrained aspects from the regional, he'll work on inverting the transect scatter, uh, data. So it's uh, uh, starting at the large scale and going down to the smaller scale. And that's one strategy for using um, uh, gravity data. In this case, he's constraining it with super regional data from other sources. Um, but there are other strategies. You can do the opposite as well, where you can use the near surface data and try and infer what's going on at depth. So it just depends on what your goal is and what you don't know and what you do know. So in this case, with his data set, he knows a little bit about the um, super regional data. So he has some uh, metal earth reflections along some lines and he also has some RMS stacking velocities from the metal earth data. He's got a depth to moho data set uh, that David Schneider worked on uh, and he's also got some slope intercept method uh, where he's worked out what the velocities are from, um, from the refraction data. There's also some wide angle refractions um, and um, <coughs> the density values he has obtained from the literature. 
So the intent here is to work out what the gravity data is associated with the mantle. So it's essentially mapping, taking the information that's known about the moho and working out what the gravity response associated with that known moho is so that can be subtracted. So that way you're removing the effects of the very deep features and you're leaving behind features that might be shallower. Uh, and then the future worker is working on these regional and transect scale ones. And he's just mapped out what he's going to be doing here, um, but I'm not going to be presenting the results. So this is the gravity data he's going to be using and some of the constraints, official geology, for example. And this is the data that he's going to be using as well at each of the different scales, which is going to be used to validate the results. So to give you a sense of the super regional stuff, <coughs> this is the um, uh, lithoprobe seismic, and this is the metal earth seismic from the south, um, the Sturgeon Greenstone Belt. These are some other metal earth transects further to the to the west, and the red line on here is uh, the interpreted depth to the uh, mid crust. So any, anything above this red line is upper crust and anything below it is uh, mid crust. And then way down the bottom here, uh, below the moho, we have the mantle. So the upper crust is assumed to have a velocity of six kilometers per second. That's generally what Mustafa found with his uh, reflection seismic data. And the density is assumed to be 2.67. And then in this um, mid crust, which Chris calls the light substrate, He's got a slightly higher seismic velocity and a higher density, and in the mantle, even more so. Okay, so this is the actual gravity data. Um, and this data has been sampled to, I think it's um, 20 kilometer um, cells here. And so you can see there's a very large gravity anomaly in here. Um, and if we just look at the data that's collected along this transect. Um, oh, sorry, this is, yes, this is the data along the transect. You can see there's a very large component of gravity that's increasing. Uh, and this is associated, this is the regional one. This is associated with this big gravity high right here. So that's the component that we have to remove. You might have heard of the expression regional residual separation. The regional is considered to be not of interest and the residual is of interest. So in this case, Chris wants to make sure that he's removed this big regional response here. So if we subtract this off, we get a low here and a high here and a low here and a high here. Uh, and those are the anomalies that we're interested in. So basically what he's done so far is he's taken that model that I just showed you with those densities and those um, seismic velocities and he's inverted his data to try and reduce the residual in the gravity data uh, using the moho depth from David Schneider's work and the other um, depths from the reflection seismic data. And uh, with that, the unknown he's trying to resolve here is what the density of the mantle is uh, because that's something that he's not really sure about. And you can see he's tried a number of different densities. There are four different ones here. Uh, and uh, the one that gives the least residual or the flattest curve is this blue one. And that's a residual density, or sorry, that's the actual, what, that's the results that we want to get. And what, the one that gets closest to it is this gray curve, which has a density difference of minus 0.8 grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, and that is equivalent to a mantle density of 3.6 grams per cubic centimeter. So essentially that's the results of that first part. He's now got a model that he can confidently use to extract the super regional. And then he's going to be, the next stage is to invert the um, intermediate and the transect scale data. So these are the preliminary conclusions and next step. So he says that the Moho mantle boundary has a varying gravity effect uh, in this Sturgeon transect and it's about 30 milligals. Uh, and that is compared with the range of actual values, which are 33 milligals. So most of the range of variations is explained by the 
difference in the depth of the Moho mantle boundary. Uh, and he's uh, concluded that the density difference uh, is about uh, 0.8 milligals. Uh, and that was just using four different values of the density contrast. He thinks that he can refine this value by doing some sort of least squares minimization. So that would conclude this work. Um, and he also um, wants to do some comparisons using cooperative or joint inversion, that type of thing. So I think that's pretty much it. How are we doing for time here? Five minutes. Five minutes. Um, do people have a lot of questions? I've got a few other slides I can show you if there are no questions right now. All right. Uh, if you do have some very detailed questions, this is Chris's email address. And I think, I think he's got his, um, I think he has his e email open on his phone. So if you send this to him, you, he might get it. Um, something that people often do in seismic data is they use what he calls the, or what is known as the Nafe-Drake curve, which is a way of taking a seismic velocity and turning it into a density. Uh, and these sorts of curves uh, work quite well in sedimentary environments, but they don't work so well uh, in this particular area. So he tried using these um, conversions where he would take the seismic velocity from the refraction seismic data and turn it into density, and he found it wasn't useful. This, just, this slide here just shows the regional gravity in North America, and there are some uh, highs up in this area here. This is the area we're talking about. So these sorts of anomalies are comparable with anomalies that he got. So this particular slide uh, was for the effect of sedimentary basins on gravity. Um, but it turns out up in the area here where there are no sedimentary basins in the shield areas, it's more the, the depth to the um, uh, mantle boundary that's important. This slide is, uh, he wanted to show this because this shows the distribution of densities in the Ontario uh, Geological Survey database. And you can see that there are two modes. There's a, a more values up here at large densities and more values and, and a peak in the values down here at low densities. And he thinks that this is because there's a problem. Generally, with, with uh, density data, you get a single peak. You don't get two peaks like this. Um, and the problem is, is, if you want to use a reasonable value for gravity or for, for the density, then you generally pick the one that's the peak value as being a good representation of the mean. But when you've got two peaks, you don't know which one to pick. Halfway in between wouldn't be a very good thing. So you either pick this one or that one. Uh, and he thinks that the problem here is that when people were collecting samples to measure the, the uh, density or specific gravity of it, they were mostly doing that in greenstone belts. So there was a bias towards these larger values. And he thinks that this value was more representative. And it turns out that uh, Gibb did some work in the late 60s where he took the densities of particular lithologies and he weighted them by the area and found that when he did that, you get a value of about 2.67. So that one's more representative. So this is something that we were talking about earlier on this morning. Uh, there's bias in the data due to the sampling. Yeah, and this just shows that uh, his results are consistent with, this is some of the data that would have been used. And that's the seismic data for the Sturgeon line here. And you can see this is, this is the base of the um, of the upper crust that he picked. And it's interesting because Chong Ma's base was this one here. He picked this through here. And Chris thinks that this feature here might be some sort of side swipe associated with the fact that the seismic data is changing angle here. So um, I guess my point here is that there's lots of different ways to interpret the seismic data. And it can be interpreted multiple ways. So you have to be a little bit careful of what the interpretations people come up with. Okay, that's it. That's the last slide. <laughs>